realized I had to start over, that everything I had learned was empty. Hello, thank you for tuning in, and welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 286. Today, I'm joined by fellow martial arts podcaster, Sifu Can Gullet. If you're new to the show, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can check out all of our other episodes, all available for free, with show notes, including videos, links, photos, lots of great stuff. And from there, you can sign up for our newsletter. You could head on over to whistlekick.com, check out the amazing products we make, and you can find links to our other online projects like marshalljournal.com, marshalartscalendar.com, marshalartsmemes.com, karatetournamentbook.com. So many great stuff. Great stuff? That's terrible grammar. So many great things. There we go. I'm just going to do this in one take because that's how we tend to do the show. We just kind of roll and let whatever's going to come out of it, come out of it. It's a fun style. It's something I appreciate doing. We don't edit too much on the back end. We just like to let you listen in on the conversations that I am so blessed to have with the amazing guests like today's guest. I've honestly lost count of the guests we've had on the show who started martial arts because of Bruce Lee. Our guest today is a proud member of the group that started training after seeing his most iconic work, Enter the Dragon. Sifu Ken Gullet is a fellow podcaster, and I really enjoyed talking with him today. We talked about titles, rank, teachers, the concept of mastery, and so much more. It's a great conversation, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Let's welcome him to the show. Hello, Sifu. How are you? <laughs> Good. Just call me Ken. Oh, well, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when we, when we, when we kick off, you know, yeah. it's, it's become kind of a hallmark to, to use titles, you know, and, and the deeper we get into this, the more I just wonder, I wonder if, if I'm just looking at it wrong. I don't know. I take a non-traditional approach in some things. And I, you know, and honestly, I think I do too, but I, I operate from this, what, what I've always called the least common denominator of offensiveness. Respect is always a good thing. Well, titles don't always mean respect. Sometimes it's, it's compulsion. And sometimes it's ego. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, so when I started the show, it was, I need to make sure I use titles because what if there's somebody out there who tunes in and they hear me refer to somebody as, you know, to be honest, you know, and this is the example I always come back to when I've talked about it on the show. Bill Wallace wanted me to call him Bill. Mm -hmm. And this predates me becoming friends with him. And, and you know, just the fact that I, I had him on the show, I, I was, you know, twitching. And I said, I can't, I can't do it, sir. Because I had this, <laughs> this vision of someone listening. You know, this is episode 13, I think. Uh -huh. Listening and saying, who does this guy think he is calling Superfoot? bill you know they it's, didn't they wouldn't have yeah. the context of that conversation how do you handle it on your show i call them by their name i i rarely even if someone calls himself a master i know that that's usually special and i don't <laughs> use it okay there are so few masters i just i'll say instructor teacher um and that's fine but uh yeah i, I it's very difficult for me after I got into Chen Tai Chi to buy into all of that, I used to, and it, it, but there are so many, it's just, it's kind of a sickness. It can be. What, how did that change when you, when you started that, <clears throat> you said Chen Tai Chi? Chen, Chen, uh, Chen style. Okay. Uh, there, that's the original style of Tai Chi. Um, I don't know. I, I had a teacher, a very good teacher, Jim Krishamanya. We may mention him, but, uh, he said, call me Jim. And that was a really eye opening for me. I have these, I have this theory and I've got to do some research to dig it up. I've got this theory that started from the way I was looking at Korean martial arts. And, and one of the, I think, I think we can say that the prime art I'm training in right now is Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. And when someone reaches a fourth degree, they're considered a master and, and forget the, potentially false symbolism in, in using that title. Yes. I wonder if there's a slight, 
I'd almost call error in translation. Could be. Because when and, we look at the title in in Japanese that is used more than any other, it's sensei. And there's there's no indication really of mastery in there. It's really just I'm the guy that knows in theory more stuff than you do, so I'm gonna share with you the stuff that I know. Mm-hmm. It's not about competency, it's um and I think the translation that a lot of people are using now is one who came before. I yeah. kind of like that. I use Sifu. I look at it as marketing on an, on a DVD or something. Really? Um, and in some, some of my DVDs, it just says Ken Gullet. I, because people, uh, I thought Sifu meant teacher. I've seen some translations that it means master and that horrifies me. I don't want that out there because I will, I don't have time in this lifetime to become a master. Yeah. If you follow that, I forget who, who said it, but the, the 10,000 hours rule, mm-hmm. you know, the idea that it takes 10,000 hours to truly master something. I mean, and it also takes good instruction behind that 10,000 sure. hours because there are a lot of bad teachers out there. Absolutely. But so you, I could practice 10,000 hours and still not know much. But if you assume that you've got amazing instruction, that 10,000 hours, I mean, if you're training full time, that's still like 20 years. Oh, yeah. Most people, by that definition, never master anything. That's right. That's right. But they sure need to think they did. Where do you get that philosophy? I don't know. We all need to be important. We all need to be king. And there are a lot of uh, egos drawn to martial arts. And actually, I think some studies show there are controlling people are drawn to the martial arts. And so I think they need to have that out there. In Tai Chi, I think a lot of people are drawn who want to be mystical. And they want people to think they have mystical abilities. And that's why I think a lot of the myths have grown up around Tai Chi, which I've spent the last 20 years trying to dispel. Did you have any of those false impressions when you started Tai Chi? A little bit. Yeah. I studied acupuncture for a couple of years and uh, bought into the, you know, I gave the chi a shot. Uh, I practice, I still practice qigong. I just interpret it differently. What do you mean by that? Are we recording, by the way? That is up to you because we've got a good conversation <laughs> going and we can, we can let it run from here. Or if you want a more formal start, we can do that too. It does not matter to me. Uh, okay. I just do you do any editing like coughs and things like that? Well, you just coughed, and so I'll, I'll make a note there. But to I'll be, try to mute my mic. Okay, but to be you know, I'll be really honest. Uh, over the last couple episodes, we've had more of a dive in head first start. It's fine with me. I loved uh, the Gene Ching interview. Yeah, the the feedback coming back from the guests um, and the audience has been phenomenal. It's felt a lot more organic and. You know, honestly, yeah. I, f- I think I'm ready for that as a an interviewer. I, I don't really love that that label, but, you know, early well, on, I needed the structure. Yeah, and this is the kind of thing, type of conversation I like to have, so I'll keep it rolling. Cool. Okay. Where were we? <laughs> I don't remember. That's okay. Uh, well, yeah, listeners. Titles. Yeah, well. You know, let, let, I'll take the opportunity now that we're, you know, seven and change in. Listeners, we're, we're here with Sifu, not that he wants me to use that title, Ken Gullet, And you have a show, so maybe we should do a little bit of context stuff since we, we kind of broke off on our flow. Um, you know, you've well, got a show and you've got some stuff going on, so maybe we'll take a moment and you can tell the listeners about that. Well, I love your podcast. I just discovered it a few weeks ago and uh, trying to promote it a little bit. You're doing a great service. And uh, I try to do the same. Mine is devoted more to the internal arts. And it's called uh, Internal Fighting Arts. That's the name of my website and the name of my podcast. Um, And it's available Stitcher and Audello and iTunes. But I try to interview martial artists who are devoted to the internal arts and have good ties to Chinese masters. 
and um, try to give them publicity. And, and at the same time, it uh, helps promote me. Mm. It's a win-win situation. Absolutely. And you're doing great work. Thank of you. Of course, you know, I, I, I hope listeners realize, you know, you're, you are not the first person to have a quote unquote competitive podcast that we've had on the show. And I don't want, I never want this show to feel like something that is restrictive. You know, I never want people to think, well, you know, it's whistle kick. So, you know, there's going to be a hard line between this show and other martial arts podcasts or this show and people tied into products. I mean, we, we are in discussion with bringing people on from companies that sell products directly competitive to ours, because yeah. I'm very much a rising tide lifts all ships kind of yeah. guy. You know, it, I don't, tr I don't look at any other martial artist as a competitor. Uh, there are other people who have do online training as I do and uh, sell DVDs as I do. And I look at all of us as martial artists who I just, I love the arts and um, you're not taking away from me and I'll promote everybody who's on my show. I promote their web websites and DVDs and books and it's a good thing, but there is a lot of, um, that isolationism in the arts where you build the walls up and anyone who is not me does not get my praise or, or whatever, but it, it, that's silly. And to me, there's a bit of a, a parallel there with the way martial arts has, and I feel should develop it. It should be tempered by, other people looking at it and comparing it to other things and testing it and seeing what works. Yeah. Just like, you know, if, if you put out a set of DVDs and everyone hates them <laughs> and, you know, 20 other people come and make better DVDs, that's going to do one of two things. You're either going to improve, hopefully, most likely, or you're going to step away. And either way, it's kind of this, this great free market sort of outcome. Yeah, yeah. I listen to other podcasts like yours, and how how can I take what you're doing, what Sensei Ando is doing, what Sensei Wilson is doing, and make this show better by taking it all in and, and analyzing? That's what I do. Yeah, that's a good show. How'd you get started? Well, I was part of the Bruce Lee boom. I was 20 years old, 1973, in college. I'd been watching the Kung Fu TV show and was fascinated by it. Not just the fight scenes, but also the morality, the, the philosophy. And I had grown up in a fundamentalist household in the South. And, um, and so that was a very interesting way to look at the world that I had never been exposed to. And then Bruce Lee hit. And when I saw Enter the Dragon, I said, I've got to start. So a month or two later, I had my first class and um, have been in it ever since. It was in Lexington, Kentucky. I grew up in Kentucky. Okay. We've had a few folks on from and around Kentucky of late. What, what was it you found... Because I, I, I always like the outcome of this question. The perception and the reality of martial arts is generally generally a pretty big gap in there. But mm -hmm. inevitably, if you go and you stay, you find something that resonates for you. And often that's something that's missing from your life. So what was it for you? You step in, you're, you're on the, the wings of the Bruce Lee phenomenon that brought so many people into training. Why did you stick around? It's interesting that I, uh, I grew up getting into a lot of fights. I was picked on and I was scrawny and I was also friendly. And when a bully would come up to a group of guys, 
they would he would pick me out inevitably as the one to pick on. And so I ended up being in a lot of fights. And what I discovered was I tried to put the fight off as long as I could. But eventually I said, you know, after getting hit a few times, I said, OK, I might as well go down swinging. And I would beat the guy up every time. And once the fight started, once I got into it, I realized how much I enjoyed it, that this was the one on one ultimate competition, the ultimate sport. And so um, I got into the arts to because of the self-defense. But I didn't realize at the time, even though I was drawn to the philosophy, the Taoism and the Zen Buddhism, I started reading about that. And over time, I think the philosophy, once you, I knew how to fight already, but the techniques I've learned over the years hopefully has just made me a better fighter. I haven't been in a fight since I was 18, other than tournaments, uh, because you get wiser too, and who wants to go to court? Who wants to go to jail? Who wants to lose their job? Um, and so the philosophy became an important part of it for me and has probably shaped my life as much as the other physical discipline that you put yourself through. The night I started, there were, the place was overflowing though, September 20th, 1973. You remember the day? I remember that's very, how important it was to me. And uh, the teacher was uh, in Lexington, the, one of the only ones at that time, legendary and still teaches today. It was not a good art. It turned out he uh, misrepresented himself, but it got me in and, it, and I earned a brown belt over the next two or three years. And it got me started on the way. But it was the crowd was flowing into the parking lot from the building. There were so many people interested that night. And uh, it's curious, after 45 years, I wonder how many of them are still practicing. I have a feeling not many. Statistically, zero. I mean, mm -hmm. other, other mm -hmm. than you. Yeah. But it, it was that's why I got into it. But the philosophy is really uh, been an important part. I'm fascinated, though, by the internal arts, especially Tai Chi, and how the movements in Tai Chi, everywhere your hands are, everywhere you move, everywhere your legs are, there's a fighting application. And using the body mechanics for that, that has really kept me inspired over the years. When did that fascination with the internal arts start? Uh, 1987. Okay. I, I was in TV news. Um, I used to be a producer for Jerry Springer when he, he was uh, in news in Cincinnati. Yeah. I, don't, I bet a lot of people don't realize that at one point he was a legitimate newsman. And the nicest guy. Really? A very nice, no ego. I worked with him for over three years and just had a good time with him. Uh, and a very smart, Kennedy-esque thinker. I just really uh, can't say enough nice things about the guy. But uh, TV news is crazy. And they hired a little guy from New York, and he came in, and he decided he didn't like me and wanted to fire me. So I ended up quitting and got a job a month or two later in Omaha. And that's where I met my first internal arts teacher, um, I was looking through the phone book. They had a ninja school and all, all kinds of schools in 1987. But I'd never investigated Tai Chi, Jingyi, and Bagua. So I investigated that, and that's what I've been studying ever since. How did your perceptions versus the reality come up there? You mentioned, you know, in, in your initial school and just... By, by saying brown belt, I'm going to guess it was some Japanese school, possibly karate school. 
It was a Shaolin, supposedly Shaolin school. They okay. called it Shaolin Do. Okay. Shaolin Karate. <laughs> and we wore karate geese. Uh, yeah, there. It was. Uh, I, I was a good student, and I actually I learned sparring techniques that won tournaments as late as two thousand five, uh, in my fifties. But um, in nineteen, we were not allowed to go to outside tournaments, and that's a good sign that you're in a bad school. Yeah. Um, and no one from the outside was allowed to our tournaments. So in nineteen seventy six. Being the rebel that I am, I went up to Columbus, Ohio to compete in a tournament and saw things that blew me away, some kung fu competitors. And so I decided to step back at that time and I left the school and started studying Taekwondo and then a few years later moved to um, Cincinnati, studied uh, with Karen Vaughn briefly, Tian Shan Pai Kung Fu, and then moved to Omaha. And that's when my studies really got a little more serious. And they got even more serious in 98 when I met, I decided that the internal I had learned was quite empty and external. And I decided to um, investigate Chen Tai Chi. And I was introduced to, or, to Jim and Angela Krishamanya in Rockford, Illinois. And they had been studying with Fung and, and with uh, George Zhu and Shan Xu Xin, and now they were studying with Chen Xiao Wang. And that's when I, uh, that made all the difference in, in my martial arts journey. As we get deeper into this show, we've seen more and more folks pop up that have some, have some time logged with the internal arts. And I think I've mentioned it on the show. Back in the fall, I took a trip. I was invited down to a dinner honoring Sifu Bausim Mark, who some listeners will know the name, others will not, but it's Donnie Yen's mother. Ah, yes. And I'm finding this very interesting, and, and, and granted, I have a very limited sample set, but the folks that I know that have some time and some skill with internal arts, there's just a different way that they present themselves, a different way that they walk the earth. It's, it's almost seems magnetic. People just seem drawn to them. Is that something that, that in your experience happens mm -hmm. a lot or have I just been lucky in some of these folks that I've met? You might've been lucky, okay, but See, I, I take a pretty down-to-earth view of these things. There are a lot of very petty, jealous people in the internal arts. Uh, I have had a, an experience or two that with instructors and teachers who were fairly well-known, one in particular who um, – uh, it was just horrible. Uh, if you he, leave out the name, are you willing to tell us about it? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Uh, it was one of my, uh, it was my second major Chen Tai Chi instructor who introduced me to Chen Sha Xing and others. I've written blog posts and made some enemies in the Tai Chi world doing that. But I believe in being honest and letting people know, don't check your brains at the school, the door of a martial arts school. Maintain your critical thinking. Don't put your teachers on pedestals. And this guy asked me to be his disciple after I had trained with him for a couple of years. And I didn't want that. I just wanted to study. And so I politely declined. The next week he called me and went off on me, called my employer, ACT, the college test. I had a very good six-figure job. And he told them I had hacked into his website using their computers and made some disparaging remarks about my wife. So there are people in the internal arts who are not what they appear to be. So buyer beware. And I ended up uh, separating from him very quickly. And that's at the point I decided to go independent. I will study with everyone. 
I'll learn from everyone, but I don't need that relationship anymore of a father son. Um, I'm 65 now. Who needs that? I just want to get better. So there are a lot of people who are who do have their heads together. There are a lot of people who make you think they have their heads together. But I think um, you just have to beware. And I don't want to make that sound too negative either. There are some really good people. But a lot of us, you know, the martial arts draws people who want to be king. They want to be top dog. And there's a lot of uh, pissing on trees when guys especially get together. Um, and that's true in martial arts as well. There have been people in the internal arts who have put gotten second mortgages on their home so they can pay a master to come in and do a workshop. And the master expects that money. Um, it's, uh, you, you can't, uh, you have to keep your eyes open and realize you're a grown up and what do you want? Do you want to learn the arts? There are plenty of opportunities to do that without um, demeaning yourself. So it sounds like you're saying that there really is little to no difference in the overall participation in internal arts versus external arts versus, I think we can even say, the world at large. I think that's true. Yeah. Hopefully martial artists become better people. I believe that over time that they do, but certainly not all of them. That is certainly the image that we have. I know that, that it's something that I've tried to do in my life. Um, there is a guy who started a business and he's selling shirts right now. And I saw one a few weeks ago with the shirts just say, do good, be kind. And that just struck a chord with me. And that's been on my mind every day. I bought a shirt and I wear it as often as I can. And people, <laughs> excuse me, people do respond to it. But uh, that it's a very simple thing to just do good, be kind. But at the same time, you have to be a critical thinker and not accept things that are uh, not quite on the level. There's a lot of that in the arts. I've, I've had, I've spent a lot of money, and I think other people listening have too, on teachers who turned out not to be what we thought they were, who embellished their backgrounds. And I certainly have spent thousands of dollars on those instructors. And uh, I think a lot of us need to. And, uh, I think some people got upset when I uh, spoke about my instructor after he passed away as something that you shouldn't do in the internal arts, but I believe that we should do it in all the arts. If, you know, I was as respectful as I could be while he was alive, mainly because he kept harassing me on online forums under assumed names. <laughs> That's the kind of, so, you know, there are people like that, but there are a lot of wonderful people too. I've interviewed a lot of people on my podcast who uh, are great teachers and great people and are really trying to do the right thing and, and grow as, as they go. But your philosophy really should guide you in your arts and your life and in how you deal with people. I developed this saying in my last career, which was IT, and I've talked about that at times on the show, because the correlations between IT and martial arts are, they're there, and there seems to be a surprisingly large percentage of people in IT who end up in the martial arts, and I haven't quite put my finger on why yet. We've, we've talked about it a little bit. There are some theories that we've kicked around. But I said, when I was hiring, I would always choose to hire the person who knew more than they thought they did rather than the person who knew less than they thought they did. <laughs> because the person who knows more than they think is far less likely to get into trouble. 
And I've seen something similar in the martial arts. There are people who, as you've said, overrepresent their skill, their, their lineage, their achievements. And then there are those who tend to be far more humble. And I find that it's those folks who have more to teach and a better ability to teach it. You know, my first Chen Tai Chi teacher I mentioned, Jim Krishamanya. When I met him, I had been in one situation after another where people were telling me they were masters when they weren't. I'm sorry, I think I have a siren going off in the background. As um, long as they're not coming for you. Yeah. Um, and he said, I'm just a hobbyist. Now, the first day I met him, I had been studying Tai Chi, more Yang style, for over a decade. I had won a gold medal doing the Yang 24 form at the 1990 Kung Fu Nationals. So I thought I knew Tai Chi. And in one hour of meeting Jim, I realized I had to start over, that everything I had learned was empty. And he said... One thing, he said, just call me Jim, which was shocking. And he said, uh, I'm just a hobbyist. There, there are no masters in the United States. There are no American masters. It's, you really have to. The difference between uh, us and a, a master, Chen Xiao Wang, Chen Yu, some of these people, is the difference between you and I going out to shoot basketballs and going up against Michael Jordan. That's the difference. They live it and eat it and have this physical skill that is beyond what we do because they've trained it from childhood. And so that, that was eye-opening for me. And that's the mark to me of a good teacher. That humility, but the striving to get better and another thing that Jim did, and and my other uh, Tai Chi teacher, was um, they looked under the hood. They asked questions and didn't didn't. Uh, they wanted to know why this movement is done this way. What are the body mechanics? How do you deliver power through that? And uh, the, the applications of this movement were important. It's uh, it's good. And I suspect that you, you said it differently, but because this has been a recurring theme, I want to poke at it. I suspect also that these folks that you're, you're lifting up with your words were perpetual students. And yes. looking under the hood, they weren't, it wasn't that they started looking under the hood, they were continually looking under the hood. Yes, and still are. Yeah, despite us getting older and, uh, you know, I lost a lung uh, due to a side effect from a medical procedure in 2009 and nearly died at Cleveland Clinic. Um, I was had a breathing tube and chest. They, they pierced my heart accidentally with a wire. <laughs> and the cardiologist said, there's nothing more we can do for your husband to my wife. She would be going out into the hallway to cry, thinking I wasn't going to make it. And I was in the hospital bed thinking, okay, my friend John Morrow is having a tournament in six months. I think I can make it. <laughs> <laughs> and by God, I won first place doing the Chen 38 form uh, at that tournament, too. <laughs> but that's the last one I've competed in. It's not as easy with one lung. And okay. I, I do hope you're going to go back and unpack some of that because you can't just leave it. <laughs> you can't just drop the synopsis of a story like that move on <laughs> you're in the yeah. hospital bed they... drop it my son drop it <laughs> walk on you're yeah. in the hospital it, it's that grim it, it appears that this is oh very final. grim breathing too my voice has never I used to be a broadcaster and uh, my voice has never been the same when I practice I, I still can improve but I have to stop and gasp. I mean, the viewers, listeners can probably tell that I breathe a little heavier than some of your guests because I'm working with one lung. And when I get excited and start talking about it, I tend to uh, need to breathe a little bit harder. 
I just assumed you were a Walter Cronkite fan. <laughs> there's there's a little bit of that that quality to your voice. Uh, he was my hero. Was he? I started in radio news and. I would read the news. Uh, two people were killed today on Harrisburg Road. And a DJ one day, Randy Davidson, said, Ken, go home and watch Walter Cronkite tonight. And notice the way he goes down in his inflection. President Nixon went to Capitol Hill today to deliver a message. And I thought it, it was a light bulb that went off. And so that that did influenced me in my news uh, reading from then on. But yeah, the, the philosophy has helped me in many different crises in my life. And that was one of them, where I did not fear death. There is nothing to fear. There are no monsters under the bed waiting to get you when the lights go out. You return to what you were before, which was nothing but an eternity of peace. And so I lay in the hospital bed near death, uh, drowning in my own blood every 20 minutes. But I didn't, I wasn't ready to go. My wife and I had only been married about seven years at that point. And, um, my daughters and, and the uh, Kung Fu, I wanted to continue getting better. And so I didn't worry about dying. I just focused on what's next. You know, there's this tournament down here. I need to, that's my goal. I want to, I want to get there and compete. Uh, and so part of that is the philosophy where you accept what's happening and you don't fear it and you don't, hold on to it, but you keep going. So tell us a little bit about the, I guess the, the mechanics. How did you move from that point, drowning in your own blood every 20 minutes to recovery, despite losing a lung and, and, and all that we, we've, we've had a few folks on the air who, have these death-defying stories. And I always receive a lot of feedback from people about how inspiring that can be. So if you could share a bit more of that story, I know the listeners are going to appreciate it. Um, well, just gradually, somehow over that two weeks in intensive care, I got better. I, I went from 206 muscular pounds working with a personal trainer to 156 when I walked out of the hospital. Uh, I looked like a skeleton, <laughs> comparatively. Um, couldn't do anything. Uh, actually, at one point in the hospital, I was so weak, I couldn't even lift myself up. They had to put a bedpan under me. And there's nothing more demeaning when you have been so strong and fit. I never smoked a cigarette. And suddenly... The nurse has left the room and you're laying in your own crap, unable to lift yourself out of it. And it really gave me a, a lot of empathy for older people. Because I was laying there thinking what a lot of older people probably think. How did this happen to me? This can't be me. I have a neighbor right now across the street. He's 96 still has his mind, lives alone. His wife died six years ago. He's become one of my best friends. And I visit him all the time. I call him all the time. My dog and I walk over. He said, two weeks ago, he said, I just really appreciate you not treating me the way other people do as just the old man down the street. And I think part of, part of what I went through made me look at all that a little differently. And the old people I see walking through the store and the old ladies who their eyes don't meet you. They look like everyone's looking through them and they look up at me and I smile at them and meet their eyes and the light in their face that comes on, someone's actually seeing me. It's, uh, you know, because inside they're 18. 
They don't know how they got here in this old body. So I think that's one thing that that experience taught me. But I think I just uh, continued to get better. And I, I was joking with nurses. I had I had to do it. They had me zonked out on all kinds of drugs because with a breathing tube, I wanted to gag it. So they had me drugged up, but I just got through it, got a little better, got home and tried to see when I could get down to the basement to practice again. And gradually, very great. It's been, it, it has, the last nine years have been a struggle. I just got over a couple of weeks with a, a lung issue. In fact, I might cough a little bit on this program. And today I start taking a medicine. I'm going to get my first injection that's supposed to help with lung irritation that costs $100,000 a year. It's $8,000 a shot, 12 shots a year. So uh, that's I start that today in a couple of hours. And hopefully that'll allow me to work out even more <coughs> and uh, continue the progress. It's all a journey. And, you know, we love the arts. We don't want to stop. But when all this happened, I think doctors were shocked that I survived. But a year later, I sent them uh, a letter and thanked them and with a picture or two saying, I'm still teaching, I'm still practicing, and I've continued to teach and practice since, just at a reduced level. There's always this dichotomy that seems to come up when someone has an incident like that. On the one hand, no one wants to go through that, the pain, the suffering, especially for the people around them, oftentimes the costs. You know, they, These are unequivocally negative things. But on the other side, when I talk to people who have had an experience like this, they're always changed. And it always seems for the better. Now, maybe you could, you could speculate that the people who aren't going to change for the better don't make it through those situations. So we're working with a, a limited sample set. But the way I hear you talking about this, it's not with any sort of regret. It sounds like it was a transitional moment for you. Maybe so. I think it was more a continuation. I mean, this has been something that I've worked into my life for quite some time. Um, for 40, 45 years since I left uh, the faith I grew up in and started exploring more of the Taoism and the philosophical Taoism and Zen philosophy. So it, it, I think once you really embed that in your in your personality and then bad things happen, you it's not anybody's fault. It's part of life. Um, I also lost a daughter in 1980. And it that's the first time that I realized that my philosophies gave me a perspective that uh, the other people that I knew in Kentucky did not share or did not have. Um, but it's, it, and that's why the arts are more than just the martial aspects and the Qigong. To me, Tai Chi is a martial art. It's not moving meditation. Qigong is the meditation part. So I practice Qigong for the centering impact it has on me. And as a result, because of the stress management, I think it produces an improvement in health. I'm a bit of a heretic. I do not believe qi is a scientific reality. But I believe these practices have benefits. Um, and Tai Chi, the main benefit is the martial art and the physical health you get from a good exercise. 
Um, I want to talk about that for a second, because you are undoubtedly on in a small group, and the only person I've ever heard that practices internal arts who has said they don't believe in the scientific reality of chi. And I'm going to speculate, you've caught hmm. a lot of flack for that. Oh, yeah. If you are as open and, and in your writing and on your show as I suspect you are, as I've heard you already, you're probably catching some hate for that stuff. Oh, I've had even uh, threats, physical threats, people saying they're going to come to my school back even 2002, 2003, I, I, I saw people who were being published in the magazines and they were showing themselves knocking down their students without touching them. And we don't need to go any names, but I sent a challenge to Inside Kung Fu. And I said, I will give $5,000 cash to anyone who can do that to me. And they put it on the front page, on the cover. <laughs> oh, well. uh, I had people threaten me. I had one Tai Chi guy and uh, instructor uh, named Wong in Tennessee who sent me a video where he's on stage surrounded by about 18 young students who are pushing on him. And he makes a slight move and all these students go flying back and falling all over the place. And I said, if you do that to me, I will give you $5,000 cash on the spot. We'll tape it. We'll have reporters there. I will publicize you worldwide because that's what I did for a living. His student threatened me. <laughs> now, come on. You've tapped into this universal energy, this truth, and you can't demonstrate it on someone who is a skeptic. And it turns out that the Randy Foundation that offers a million dollars to people who can prove psychic phenomenon is true or mystical or supernatural. He took one of the guys who became famous over this and tested him. 18 people who did not know what this guy was going to do, Tai Chi, Chi Master. He said he could do it through a partition. So they put a thin partition up so that the person couldn't see what he was doing, had no idea. And they were just told, stand there. Well, he's behind this partition doing his thing. Not one of 18 people wobbled. None of them and a, a jury of scientists looked at it, and it's a double-blind uh, trial, the, the way you eliminate cheating. No one has ever gotten that million dollars from the Randy Foundation, and yet their students will fall down at command. And you see the video on sure. YouTube, the, type, the Chi Master knocking his students down, then he takes on an MMA guy and gets the crap knocked out of him. That's good stuff. And that, unfortunately, is what has happened to the internal arts. Now, there's a growing number of people like me who, because of Facebook and because of social media, I think uh, it's like religion. Younger people are growing in their atheism because unlike when I was a child, you can't, you couldn't go online and discover quickly how the adults are lying to you. But now there are other, there are voices online that give you the truth. And I think as a result, the internal arts hopefully will be dragged kicking and screaming away from the mysticism and into what they actually are, which are martial arts. Is it, and I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I'm going to attempt Good. to not let my personal beliefs influence any of these questions. So we're talking about a pretty extreme manifestation of chi. If, if chi is real, the extreme far end of the spectrum of its application, of its understanding, of its use 
would be the ability to externally manipulate uh, Correct. matter. You're, I agree. That is extreme. The majority, the typical way I hear Chi discussed is as a purely internal, um, in, in a purely internal way, the idea of manipulating energy within your own body. Are you discounting that possibility as well? Well, uh, I'm completely open-minded to evidence. And so I, I still practice Qigong, and I use it. I even discuss Qi in my classes. My students know what I'm talking about. I'll, I'll say, hey, sink your energy. Your Qi is in your chest, and they know what I'm saying. Um, but they know, also know that there is no way I can know or anyone can know that chi is in my chest. I, I'm just carrying myself too high and not in a balanced way where I can defend myself. Um, that's all that means. Sink your energy, lower your center of gravity, root yourself, um, so I, I do interpret it, but I, I I had a guest on my podcast, uh, Harriet Hall. Uh, she is known as the Skep Doc, and uh, she is part of um, fact-based science. I think that's it, science-based medicine uh, dot org. But they investigate. They are doctors, researchers who investigate clinical trials. And there is really not a lot of evidence that a lot of the in traditional Chinese medicine is any more effective than placebo. There are some pain management uh, benefits to acupuncture, but it's pretty limited. Uh, nothing like people think it is. And I uh, studied acupuncture for two years. I could do it. I had the the equipment and decided not to after a while. I just didn't see that it – it's like prayer. If you have 10 people and you pray for 10 of them uh, who are sick and nine people die but one recovers, you say, see, prayer works. And acupuncture is the same way. A lot of people are not helped. But if this one person does have a migraine that it that is cleared up afterwards, we say, see, it works. And there are, have been recent news stories <laughs> that um, you can't trust clinical trials from China. They manufacture facts and they bury the trials that show ineffectiveness. Mm. It, yeah. If you Google that, um, clinical trials, China scams, uh, you'll see, I mean, we're talking legitimate news stories here. Uh, and so I didn't realize that until I talked to Harriet Hall, and then I did some more investigation. But um, there, there's a lot of stuff out there that makes but they they do make it sound very plausible sure. they're experts i just uh i'm open-minded it would be nice if it worked but the evidence still isn't there after all these years and i don't want to beat this up too much you know you, yeah. you've expressed your opinion and i don't want the major takeaway for the folks listening to be that you know th this is the important piece because that, that's not it no, no, this is and, this is a part of your story, and I yes. think it is interesting because it's while you're not unique, I think it may give some confidence to people in other arts who, you know, maybe uh, have a different perspective. Maybe some of their core beliefs don't jive with the people they train with or train under, and that's okay. But not only that, it's when you do. Tai Chi, if you follow the correct body mechanics, 
you have chi flow whether it exists or not. I can demonstrate what I can demonstrate chi flow in just whether you have the ground, whether you have pung, which without the ground and pung working together, you don't have anything. What's pung? Pung is an expansive kind of a feeling that you train yourself to do. Pung gen, ward off energy, it's sometimes called. But energy in Tai Chi has been misinterpreted. The eight energies of Tai Chi are eight methods of dealing with incoming force. It really has nothing to do with any kind of invisible energy in your body. There are eight methods. You can repel it. You can brush it aside, roll back. You can uh, split it by taking one part of the body one way, the other part the other way. Uh, that's what energy means in body mechanics. If you have, there, there are six main body mechanics I teach. If you have those, you will have chi flow. It's the ground path, pung, whole body movement, which is amazing how a lot of people don't do even in Tai Chi. Uh, opening and closing the gua. Um, silk reeling, spiraling energy, and Dantian rotation. And if you put those together, you have the body mechanics for quality Xingyi, Tai Chi, and Bagua. But I meet people who have studied Tai Chi like I did for over 10 years. They've studied 20, 30 years, and they don't know how to step behind me and take me down with their body mechanics. They don't know how to move. But they have been told for 20, 30 years they're cultivating chi. And it's just not, they're just not cutting it that way. So what is chi? If you, you know, it's like, if you want to believe it's there, fine. If it helps you, fine. But um, there are ways to accomplish what you want with the body mechanics of the internal arts without going into the science that has never really been proven through means that can really be independently verified in double blind situations. Let's take a hard left <laughs> at this point. I want to, I want to go back. I want to talk about competition because you've alluded to that. You talked about some competition that you did early in your career and you kind of hinted at, as to some competition in your, forgive me, uh, your, your middle years, which is, not something that tends to happen. Most people compete in their teens, 20s. I mean, anybody that's been to a competition sees how quickly it drops off Yeah, in open competition. What I is love com competition. Talk about it. Yeah. What, what does competition mean for you? Uh, I think it sets, it helps you set goals and it always drove me to get in good shape. I loved sparring, even point sparring. Uh, the first video I made in the days of VHS was a tournament point sparring tape that I still sell on DVD. And um, it's just, I think maybe I felt the way I did when I was young and picked on and got into fights. I think it's just the ultimate competition where you have to size up this opponent and his strengths and weaknesses very quickly and try to score. And, you know, as we get older, we can't be beating the hell out of each other and breaking bones. So to me, point sparring still enabled you to develop techniques and test your coolness under pressure and, and look at timing and, and uh, all of that. I just loved it. And as I got older, I would get in shape by for a tournament by going uh, 12 or 13 rounds on a heavy bag, alternating rounds where I would 
punch as fast as I could as many times and then alternating rounds where I kicked. And it enabled me to win tournaments up until I was in my 50s. But after I lost the lung, that I still want to compete. I, they had tournaments around here occasionally, and I said, yeah, I just want to go up and do the Chen 38. Starting in the late 90s when I was competing, I, I started doing Tai Chi in open tournaments against all styles. I would do the Chen 38 especially, and I would punctuate the slow, graceful movements with bursts of Fa Jing. And it, I think it surprised a lot of the karate and taekwondo people, Kuk Sulwan and other artists who were there. And it really raised the respect. And I have a student who I've been teaching for over 20 years now, and I've only had four, three Black Sash students in the curriculum that I do. One of them, Chris Miller, went to a t big tournament in Dubuque um, two or three weeks ago. All styles, he was the only internal artist there, won first place in forms against about 10 other black belts. And that just is thrilling to me to get the message out that these are martial arts. So, but I, I just think it, you know, things like that give you the opportunity to make friends gets the heart out, and uh, also gives you information about yourself. There was a time when I, I would go to these outside tournaments, and I was doing a Xing Yi form, 12 animals, and I, there was a woman uh, from karate, I believe, and she kept scoring me low, tournament after tournament. And I went up to her after one competition. I said, could I ask why you score me low? And she said, yes, you burn through this like a house on fire. There's no pacing. And I went back and looked at a video and I thought, she's right. You know, at first you think, well, what the hell do you know? <laughs> but I went back and looked and she's absolutely right. And so I started developing more pacing in the form, putting more of the body mechanics into it and slowing down here and there. And it was very good advice. And actually, I started winning more after that. So there, you can learn a lot from tournaments. Uh, the only full contact match I've been in was the Tough Man contest in Sioux City, Iowa in 1991. And um, I had to do it. I was 38 years old. The cutoff was when you're 39. I didn't have know if I'd have a chance again. And I got in with a guy who was about 10, 15 years younger and uh, taller and heavier. And uh, <laughs> I was scared to death. I thought, what the hell am I? I was news director at the local TV station. And what the hell am I doing here? These guys were coming in. They looked ripped and they were like 250 pounds. I was one. 85. But uh, as soon as he threw his first punch, I knew I had him because he was slow. And I had fun. I did a bolo punch and uh, just had a good time. He almost rung me up in the third round. He hit me on the side of the head and my brain was like a tuning fork, just numb. But it cleared real quick. And I've got all the video. I've put it up online before, I think. And, uh, it was, it was, I was so glad I did it, but I didn't return for the second night. I could have, but since I won my match, because I thought, who the hell needs this? There was a pain in the center of my head after the match that I couldn't identify. And I thought, who needs to go through this time after time? That's enough. I proved it to myself. I did it. That's good. So I've, I've not done full contact since. Why did you do it? Oh, it's. Uh, I tried it once before, about 10 years before. Went to Kentucky. Uh, I was in Kentucky at the time. And they tried to put on a tough man contest in Richmond, where I went to school. And I went down, and my best one of my best buddies was with me as my corner man. And there was this 
ripped guy sitting in front of us and turned to him. I said, why are you here? And he looked up and grinned and he was missing half his teeth. And he said, I just like to fight. (laughs) And my friend looked at me and said, you're going to get killed. (laughs) And so fortunately, they didn't get a doctor that night to commit to certifying the fighters. So they had to cancel it. But I'd had to try later. Just it's a macho thing, you know. I look at the MMA fights, and even though I see something very ugly there, I love it. As a guy, you know, you want to get in there. I was was at a sports bar with my wife a couple of nights ago having a bite to eat, and they had MMA matches on, and I was mesmerized. Every technique they were throwing, I was thinking, what would, how would Tai Chi handle this? What would I do? against this. And I'm, I wish more would get out there and do that more in Tai Chi. Do you feel an obligation? You almost strike me as someone who's kind of on this cutting edge, this, this um, transitional point in internal arts, because as you alluded, social media and the internet and the ability to share this information so quickly. Do you feel any kind of obligation? to the art that you love to make it practical, to make it real and to be honest. Okay. Yes. Um, my, I don't want to turn this into a plug, but I I just completed a DVD. Plug away. I've never seen this done on video. When Chen Shaoxing visited my home for a week in 2006, he didn't speak a word of English. I didn't speak a word of Chinese, but we practiced every day. He held a workshop at my school. I owned a bricks and mortar school at that time. But we would practice push hands in the basement. And there is a pattern where you, you step toward your opponent. I would step in, and before I knew it, I was on my back. And I got up thinking, how the hell did he do that? So we'd start again and step back, step forward, boom, on my back again. The second time I kind of laughed. Happened a third time and a fourth time. By that time, I'm laughing. He's laughing. I have no idea how he's doing it. And it was about the 10th time that I realized he was taking control of my center and dis disrupting my structure in a subtle way that I couldn't even feel at first. And it, it took me 11 years to finally start piecing that together. How do you use the eight energies of Tai Chi to take people down who come up and grab you? When they're trying to take you down, How do you take them down instead without using muscle, without using wrestling? Um, And I developed a step-by-step approach, and it works. I invited younger guys in from other arts and said, take me down. (laughs) And they couldn't do it. Um, it's now I need to, I'm going to keep pushing it and I'm going to keep inviting people in because one, it tests me, it tests the principles. And so what happens when you do meet someone who I'm sure they're out there. There are a lot of the guys that I brought in were good martial artists who have done different things, including judo, but you know, I want a young, strong MMA guy to come in and let's work on this stuff. And I try to do that in a friendly way to share information uh, and to test each other and show each other what we do, because I respect all the arts. But there's something about the internal. It's really there, but there aren't too many people who get to that point where, OK, how do I use these energies which, let me repeat, energy means method. How do I use this method 
on this technique. It's, it's fascinating to me, and that's what I spend a lot of my time um, working on, how to decode these movements to what they really mean. Wow. Inside Tai Chi, inside every movement in Tai Chi, you'll find chinna, you'll find elbow breaks, takedowns, kicks, punches, uh, gouges. It's fascinating. And I've been working on this. My, the first DVDs I put out on Lao Chi Yilu were in 2008 on the fighting applications. And there are more than 700 fighting applications I put on these DVDs for one form. And there are more since then. Well, let's talk about the stuff you've put out. Let's, let's talk about the DVDs because we've been talking about that. And then let's talk a bit more about your podcast. And... Well, the main thing I do is know where to find all these things. have an online um, school where I've made over 800 video lessons and PDF downloadable documents, and people uh, get online and they stream it on any device 24-7. The DVDs, you know, I you keep trying to figure out, okay, what technology is good. I started in VHS, then went to DVD. I think DVD sales are slowing a little bit and streaming is probably where it's at in the future but i'm always trying to be aware of the new things that are out and i i do everything myself from the content creation to the video editing to the dvd burning to photoshop and uh, created the website do you enjoy doing all that accessory work you know because i was in news i started in High, on the high school paper, photographer and writer, and then in radio news, so the podcast comes easy, and in TV news, so the video comes easy, and I use Premiere to edit the videos. So I, I do it's a, and I do all the marketing, and so every day for me is a creative explosion. What do I need to do? What can I do for my m- members and for? people out there and what knowledge can I impart on Facebook, not just promoting, but what value can I give them? What can they walk away thinking, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, That's that's my goal every day. And then just the creative process of doing it all. But the DVDs are on Amazon. They're on uh, my website, kungfu4u.com, which you have to forgive me. That was in the 90s. I created that. <laughs> Kung Fu. The, Is it the number, number four? F- number four letter and the letter U. And then uh, my blog is internalfightingheartsblog.com. But, uh, my main website for the school is internalfightingarts.com. Okay. And, and of course, folks, we'll link to all that at the show notes. Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Dot com. Yeah, and I'm, I've been promoting your podcast and will continue to do so. Oh, it's, thank you. Uh, I put up uh, the Gene Ching one this morning, which I thought was really good. Oh, and such, the such Bill a, Wallace one was great. Yeah, I, I, I have, and you get it, most of the listeners, we, we have a few listeners who also have martial arts podcasts, and, but the vast majority of people listening do not. We are lucky, are we not? To oh. be able to call what we're doing. I mean, this is work for both of us right now. We get to hang out and talk about martial arts and call it work. You know, what fascinates me about the people I try to interview and is the pain they go through, the journey and the trouble, the hard work they go through to learn these arts, the dedication. It's admirable. And uh, these people, one thing that frustrated me over time was that you didn't see any um, anyone but Asians on the cover of the magazines, Tai Chi and others. Now, that's changed a little bit, but I, I wanted to develop a podcast because I knew there were a lot of good internal arts teachers out there. I wanted their stories and, um, and not just focus on the masters. There are some really good people. Uh, teaching and working and trying to get better. Right. 
what have we not touched on? We we've talked about pretty much all of it. I mean, we we've got what you're doing and people how people can find you. Uh, we we you know, we talked about how you started. We talked about some of your core beliefs. I mean, we've we've gone pretty deep. Is there anything that you wanted to chat about before we start winding down? Um, you know, I think one of the one of the ways that this um, the arts and the philosophy have helped me was um, I mentioned briefly that I lost a daughter in 1980. Yeah. Um, that was I got up to go to work and she was dead in in her bed, six weeks old. Um, just absolutely devastated. Went to the funeral home and they took us through to choose out these tiny little caskets and um, had services the next couple of days. Uh, was, uh, visitation. And I took her out of her casket and held her. And I think people thought I was going crazy. But I was into these philosophies at that time. And I was at such a deeply low level. But there was a little voice in my head as I was holding her when people were coming up and saying, she's in a better place. And I would say, no, the best place for her is with her father. Politely telling them, please back off with that. <laughs> um, but a little voice in my head was going, you can not accept the joys of life without accepting this. This is part of life. It's not fair, but it's part of it. And I was devastated. But two days later, after it was all over and I was driving down Georgetown Road between Georgetown, where I lived, and Lexington, it had been raining for two or three days. And the sun came out and boom, a ray of light hit the car. And I thought, I can, I felt life is a journey. What a journey. Throw anything at me you can. I can deal with it. And to me, that moment illuminated the rest of my life. And it's because of taking to heart not only the arts, but, you know, this centering, calming, self-discipline that we're supposed to be developing through these arts that so few people really do, but really should work on it. And, um, and so by the time the illness came around in 2009 and, the, and that sort of thing, you know, how you ask how I got through that or recovered, but that's why I say it was a continuation. You know, the, the worst had already happened to me. And so anything else after that, I knew I could handle. And so, you know, throughout the rest of my life, um, I'm 65 now. And I, doctors are surprised I'm still here. I'm going to go as long as I can. And if I can, I'm going to compete in the tournament again. But uh, you just keep going and enjoy every moment. Because it's, it's just, this is a journey. And everything should be instructional. I found Sifu Ken Gullet to be straightforward. And an individual who seemingly never gets tired of telling interesting, amazing stories. His view of the martial arts clearly transcends the physical, and that's something that I value a great deal. Thank you, Sifu Gullet, for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom and being so generous with your time. Listeners, you can head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com 
to find the show notes, including links to what Sifu Gullet has going on, some photos, our other episodes, you can sign up for the newsletter, and all that other great stuff that we have going on, all to serve you, a traditional martial artist. If you want to reach out to me, you can do so directly. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. I love getting feedback. You can find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick. And don't forget our products you can find on whistlekick.com or Amazon. A number of other places. We're out there. We're all over the place. We're doing it all for you. That's all I've got for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.